I'm a father. I have two children. Uh, when my girl was very, very little, she was two years old, I never forget this. Her mother's back in the bedroom. And I can hear her mother trying to get Alyssa, who's about two and a half years old, to try and figure out what to wear. And pretty soon, my wife apparently kind of gets a little frustrated and says, I don't know, Alyssa, go ask your father. So down the hallway comes the most beautiful sight I ever see. It's my little girl. She's got a red dress in this hand. She's got a blue dress in this hand. She toddles up to me and she's like, Daddy, which one do you like? And I'm like, well, besides loving the little girl in the middle, mm, I like the red dress. My little girl turns around without a word. Just, she's walking back to her mom and her mom goes, Alyssa, which one are you going to wear? And she goes, I'm going to wear the blue dress. <laughs> Daddy's going to wear the red one. <laughs> and you know, what I love about that moment is that she's making her own choices, is that she's just doing her. And I think that has a lot to do with what everybody who graces this stage is going to be sharing from their visceral life experience is what if you really just do you. E.E. E. Cummings said, that's the hardest, most notable, worthy battle you'll ever fight in your life is you to be you. But actually, the way I plan to open this, this day, and let me welcome you to Bliss Talks. Give yourselves a hand for being here. Bliss. I happen to have had the privilege to be in rehearsal and to watch this show in advance. And I have been doing events for 25 years of my life. And on God's honor, this is the single one I'm the most excited to be out. You will see me being out in the audience to try and catch everything that's happening on this stage because I know how impactfully wild uh, the people who grace this stage are going to be as long as you're open to it. So I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, the way I really planned on opening was with three stories. Do you guys like stories? You want to hear stories? Three stories? So I thought that instead of just telling three stories the ordinary way, I would try to tell three stories all at once. Have you ever heard three stories all at once? <laughs> Let's try it, all right? So this is a true story about a comedian. This is a true story about a connoisseur. And this is a true story about a catastrophe, sir. And you could take the heat off of my mic a little bit, please. All right, let's start. Chapter one, the comedian. Comedian's name is Jeff. Jeff, um, well, he used to do comedy in college all the time. As a matter of fact, Jeff would put on his own shows in the dormitory cantina, pack them out. 200 people close the door. The other 100 cannot get in. And Jeff was so crazy funny. Everybody's like, Jeff, you're going to Saturday Night Live. But, you know, after college, uh, Jeff got a job with a company. It's okay. And he's got a beautiful family. The connoisseur in our story is Amy. Amy is a connoisseur of comedy, no less. As a matter of fact, she loves her job because she travels the world just searching for the next rising star in comedy. And if she finds the one, Amy is the rainmaker who sends them to the big show. My friends, unfortunately, I, Patrick Combs, am the, am the ca catastrophe in this story. And it has just happened to me. I'm at Brookdale Community College in their theater in New Jersey. And I have just bombed, probably like no comedian has ever bombed. Um, I'm horrified at what I just put the audience through for a painful two and a half hours that they will not get back from their life. And I just want to disappear into the green room and crawl home and perhaps never see another human being in my life. That was my ninth attempt at comedy. I'm not getting better. I'm getting worse. Chapter two. So Jeff, the way he keeps his hands in on comedy uh, is this. He, he applies for the San Francisco Fringe Festival. It's a tiny little theater festival. It's not even curated. It's not a matter of how talented you are. It's actually a lottery, which is means as long as you got 100 bucks and you got the title of a show, you throw it in, and if you're drawn out of the hat, then you are in a legitimate, tiny 40-person uh, theater for six shows. So Jeff puts his name into the hat, hoping to be picked. 
Amy flies into San Francisco from New York, um, after, or from London after seeing comedy there, and she watches comedy in San Francisco, but she doesn't feel that she's seen the one that she's looking for, the rising star. So she's on her way to fly out to New York, but lo and behold, unexpectedly, her flight is delayed, which means she's got time to kill now for an evening in San Francisco. After the catastrophe, I have gone into the green room, my friends, and I've closed the door, and I'm just hoping nobody wants to talk to me. But there's a knock on the door. It's Scott. Scott is actually my best friend. Scott was the best man at my wedding. We go way back. I invited Scott to see the show that night because I thought I was going to do good, and Scott is a talent agent. So I was going to get his professional opinion. I don't want it now. But he comes in and he goes... Patrick, you know I love you. And you don't want to hear that, right? You know I love you. But you're embarrassing yourself. I'd go so far as to say you're humiliating yourself. You got to stop. I'm funnier than you are. And I'm a talent agent. And we give a hug. And he leaves. And there's another knock on the door. Damn it! I invited Martin too. See, Martin is Canada's top motivational speaker. He's a friend of mine. Um, and, you know, I just, I value his opinion so much that I had him fly a thousand miles to watch me bomb like this. Martin comes in the door. Patrick, you know I love you, brother. <laughs> and tonight is the best I have ever seen of you. You liked my show? No, man, your show is shit. <laughs> then why would you say this is the best you've ever seen? Because I didn't know you had so much courage, brother. So much courage to go after this new dream and walk through fire to try and get there. My friend, if you just keep taking small steps, you're going to go giant places. And I think to myself, stupid motivational speakers, and he excuses himself. And I crawl home to San Francisco, and I decide I gave it the good old college try for nine months. This comedy thing, although I dreamed of it, I don't have what it takes, and I quit. Chapter three. Jeff is just, you know, doing what we all do. He's cruising around on the internet one night, and suddenly he comes across a name he hasn't seen in 12 years. Somebody that he went to college with, somebody that remembers actually did an appearance at one of his comedy cantina nights, right? And he decides, oh, I wonder what he's up to. Uh, and he calls, reaches the guy, and they have a catch-up phone conversation. Amy, killing time in San Francisco, actually looks up and sees, oh, there's something called the San Francisco Fringe Festival. Uh, she thinks, maybe I can see some comedy there. And so she buys secures one of the last available tickets for a show that's got a huge buzz on it. It's selling out, and uh, it's comedy. You gotta fast forward six months in my life. I tried to give up comedy, but my heart wouldn't let me. And I have just experienced something that I will take to my grave. I'm at the San Francisco Fringe Festival, and I just did a successful show. I sold it out. It's a tiny theater. It's not anything to brag about. It was only 40 people. But for me, it was like, oh, I, I just always dreamed of telling an audience a story and, and having a sellout is, you know, the height of that dream. And I made people laugh. I did. I could tell I made people laugh with the story. I'm so, I'm over the, I'm overflowing with love. Like, I'm overflowing with bliss. It's actually perhaps one of the peak moments of my life, aside from the birth of my children. A woman comes up to me uh, as the audience is filing out, and she says, you were funny. And I go, oh, thank you so much. It's a funny story. She goes, no, you were funny. We should talk. And she hands me her card. The woman is Amy. Unfortunately, Jeff didn't get his name drawn out of the hat that year. But fortunately, I'm the person that he spotted after 12 years and decided to just call and catch up on. Jeff is the reason. I knew that San Francisco Fringe Festival existed. Jeff is the person that said, you should apply.
we should talk. And she hands me her business card. I take her business card and I look down on it and I can barely believe my eyes. H B O. I've seen those letters before. And two months later, because Amy selected me as the quote rising star that year, I was performing in Aspen, Colorado at the number one comedy festival in the United States of America with these people. And let me tell you, it was freaking intimidating. I was so scared, but it was actually also one of the times of my life. My friends, what amazes me the most is that when I almost didn't apply for the San Francisco Fringe Festival, because I was so afraid of failing again. It would have, I had six shows there, I had failed nine of them before, and I just thought, do I really want to fail six more times? Do I want to get that number up to 15? And I'm going to be honest with you, I only sent in the application because I spotted a line at the bottom of it that said, if you're selected for the Fringe Festival, you can withdraw and receive your money back as long as you do it in 30 days in advance. And that was the crutch I needed on that day to find just enough self-belief to give that comedy thing a try one more time. See, it was Paulo Coelho in the book, The Alchemist. Has anybody here read The Alchemist? Oh my God, I'm so excited. There are a lot of like minds here. Um, uh, the Alchemist, a very influential book in my life. Uh, and he says, fear is the only thing that can stop a person from reaching their dreams. And this is what I feared when I stepped into comedy after 10 years of inspirational speaking. Uh, I looked at it and said, yeah, but I have no acting lessons. And what I'm attempting to do in my form of comedy is it involves a ton of acting. And I didn't go to acting school, but I also had zero theater experience, unless you account, I mean, to be honest, I was in Oliver in second grade. I was workhouse boy number two. Um, but outside of that, no other theater experience. And I also had zero theater connections. Like, I knew nobody or nothing that I could call and go, I'd like to develop a comedic one-person theater show. But worse than that, if you're going to put together a one-person theater show, you better have a director, right? If you've got no training and you don't know what you're doing, you better have a director. There's no way I could get a director. So I also was going to go into the endeavor with no director. But, but really, truly, the worst thing of all uh, was that aside from having no script and I wanted to do a show, you're supposed to be funny in comedy. Okay? And here's what happened to me in my life. I was inspired to do a one-person show at about 22 years old because my girlfriend took me to a theater and we saw a guy perform a one-man show and his name was Spalding Gray. Has anybody here ever heard of Spalding Gray? Yeah, you can give, you can give Spalding Gray a round of applause because Spalding Gray started the entire medium that I dreamed of being in, right, in New York. In New York. But, but here I am dreaming of Spalding Gray who, who literally... Uh, his movie was filmed, his theater performed so good that Jonathan Demme filmed his performance and it was released in theaters nationwide and it made him a star and he won Tonys and he toured the country. I mean, he was the pinnacle of talent in the medium I was dreaming of with all these things against me. But see, when I walked out of Spalding Gray at 22, I turned to my girlfriend and I said, oh my God, what I would do, what I would give to do what he just did. And she said, yeah, but you'd have to be funny. <laughs> and you know what? All of us are vulnerable somewhere in our dream. And that was like an arrow that went where I had zero armor. And I thought, it just burst a balloon instantly. And I said, yeah, I'm not funny. What was I thinking? I got all caught up in how funny he was, how easy he makes it look. And I put that dream away for 10 years. I would not start those attempts at comedy for 10 years from paralyzing lack of self-belief. But there's this. And if there's one quote that I steer my life by now, 
after 30 years of working on my bliss and my dreams, it's this one. It was said over a thousand years ago by a sage named Patanjali. And Patanjali said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, then all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations and your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive and you discover yourself to be a far greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. See, when I finally took up the bliss of a one-person show, it was my extraordinary project, and I became that better person, and it enabled me to rise to the occasion. As a matter of fact, uh, it, the promise of a new and wonderful world in my life, my bliss looks like this, looking out and seeing theater audiences like that, seeing promotion in the, in, in the London Times that large, seeing that kind of promotion for my event. This is my bliss, is looking out and, and knowing I, my job is to make those people laugh, to take these people on to a journey. And, and then to receive accolades like this after failing for a year, even if they're misspelled on recession, I'll take it, all right? Um, to make lifelong friends in a country I never dreamed of, Ireland, to go to Edinburgh and play the number one festival in the world, which took me to the cafe across the street that I didn't know existed, the Elephant Cafe, where I found this postcard of that woman, J.K. Rawlings, while she's writing a book that the world will later know, but currently she's struggling to believe in herself in this photo. And I went in this cafe and, hey, for fun, if you stand here and you look right that way, you see a castle. And I saw this on TV. On, uh, John Stewart was interviewing her when she wrote Unusual Vacation, the first book to come out after Harry Potter. And John Stewart said, I think it's brave uh, of you to write a second novel after the great success of your first. And she said, and I grabbed a pen and wrote it down so freaking fast. I think the brave thing was working on something for seven years with no hope of getting it published. I look back and think, I was brave then for showing a lot of self-belief. Joseph Campbell says, the big question is whether you are going to be able to say yes to the adventure that your bliss is calling you on. Every single one of you has a spark of bliss, a seed of bliss that was planted in you. And if you've already lived it once, a new one is planted. All of us at every point in our life can look inside, uh, can find our way to this magical, mystical calling that calls us to an adventure into the unknown, but also has in store for us the greatest treasures we'll ever find in our life. And that's why that opening clip where he says, if you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one that you are living, follow your bliss, and don't be afraid, and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be, and when Bill Moyers, in that interview said, do you ever get the sense that there is an unseen helping hand? In the depths of my soul, every time I hear it, I think, how is it that Jeff called me after 12 years as an unseen helping hand? How is it that Amy's flight got delayed and she wandered into a festival that HBO refused to send people to for 20 years and wandered into my show. That is my personal evidence of a guiding unseen hand. What makes you come alive? Where is your joy calling you to? What do you dream of being great at? Many things will spark your imagination, but what pulls at your heart who in the world do you see living your rapture? I saw mine through Spalding Gray. Here's the thing. My friend Lanny, his bliss was the Olympics and rifle shooting. And by gosh, he won. 
He won a gold medal. I'm standing next to him one day and he says, Patrick, you see all those people on the stage, what do you think they have in common? I said, I don't know. I mean, athletic ability, persistence. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? I said, I don't know. He said, Patrick, there's not a realist among them. There's nothing realistic about going for the Olympics. They're all dreamers. Every single person that's going to come up on this stage is going to remind you the power in you to be a dreamer. Where your best self lies and where your greatest treasure lies. Thank you so much, my friends, for allowing me to share my bliss with you.